This story is one of the scariest and most disturbing I have ever heard, and no one is physically harmed. I'm low-key scared to post this video, though, because of the online community that I am about to call out. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. And real quick, before we get into today's video, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Ren. We are all very aware of the climate crisis going on, and while too many of us it seems kind of like it's almost futuristic, like we don't really have to worry about it yet, deep down we know that's not true. I mean, a perfect example is the increase in wildfires just due to the hotter and drier temperatures now. Here, even in Washington, Washington State, even though we were lucky enough not to be affected by the fires, we still got really bad air quality for weeks because of the smoke. No single person can fix the climate crisis, but with REN, we can make a real difference. On their website, it's only a few easy steps to calculate your personal carbon footprint. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint, you will receive monthly updates from the projects that you support, like rainforest protection and planting trees. You get to see what your money is spent on with photos and details on every tree planted, every acre reforested, and every ton of carbon offset. One project that I really love that they're doing is the clean cooking fuel for refugees in Uganda. This not only helps refugees, but reduces emissions and prevents deforestation. Start offsetting your carbon footprint today by using my link in the description below. The first 100 people who sign up will have an extra 10 trees planted in their name. So this video was actually chosen by my my lovely patrons, but this video concept and idea that I've had actually goes back more than a year. I received this email from a subscriber who back in their teenage years got sucked into this very strange community on Tumblr called TCC, aka the true crime community on Tumblr. If you're too young to remember Tumblr, Tumblr rose in popularity back in the late 2000s. Founded in 2007, it was primarily used as a blog, but quickly became a bigger platform of social media. People share photos, ideas, quotes, music, tons of other stuff. It's not just blog posts. This is how one of the leaders in this Tumblr community, Elizabeth LeCron, not only went to prison for a very long time, but if she ever gets out, she's gonna be watched by the FBI for the rest of her natural born life. Now, first, to be clear, the person we're going to talk about, Elizabeth, her obsession with true crime is definitely on the bad side of the true crime community. Most of us who are interested in true crime and that kind of stuff definitely do not associate ourselves with these types of people. We're not even talking about just the toxic side of true crime that we see, people that hate hearing from families or hearing stories from the family's point of view, honoring victims is boring to them, like that. And we're not even talking about the toxic side where people not only glorify serial killers and other violent criminals, but romanticize them. We are talking way worse than that. These people glorify killers, but not only that, they idolize them. They believe that all the crimes they carried out and all the lives they took were for a good reason and for a good cause. They believe that these killers do not belong in prison. It is a very cult-like mentality that centers primarily around mass shooters and terror attacks. We've talked in previous videos about the super like fangirls of killers, the very young, usually minors who claim that they're like in love with them. This is some of that, but not only do they claim to be in love with them, but they actively encourage what they did and think that others should follow suit. This side of true crime is not just toxic, but dangerous. So given all that, for obvious reasons, the subscriber who sent me this story would like to remain completely anonymous. Additionally, any of the screenshots that I share that have likely minors in them, I'm going to censor out their full usernames and profile pictures because to my knowledge, they never committed a crime and have never done anything wrong and were just very, very young, impressionable kids that got caught up in the wrong thing and have likely grown out of it. 
The other bummer about trying to report on this story is that a lot of the stuff has been deleted just because of Tumblr's community guidelines. They've, you know, taken down these communities on multiple times in a lot of their posts. We have some of it archived though, and that's what we're going to talk about. So Elizabeth Lacron, the main person that we are talking about, her username was ligature markings at first. And then after that account was taken down, she switched to a new account called the Charleston Church Miracle. However, most people in the communities just called her by her nickname, B, and that's probably what I'm going to be referring to her in this video. She was a mod of the Discord server and she was just very active in the Tumblr community. Here is a screenshot of her profile on Discord. Notice that her bio says, let's get this murder. On June 3rd, 2018, she posted this photo of an infamous mass and it says, you don't know what real hatred is. I'm gonna try my best not to say the names of these infamous shooters in this video just because like, fuck them. You could probably figure out who this is very easily. If I can't censor their names, then I can't, but just for the sake of not being disgusted with myself. Anyway, B was particularly obsessed with this particular shooter as well as the Columbine shooter. She then posted this photo of her friend Vinny that says, this is my close friend Vinny. He likes to dress like this in the first picture. He's a true crime boy. The shotgun is mine. Hmm. <laughs> Who? Here's another one that just says born to kill. Thought she was really edgy with that one. Then I found this Twitter thread by this user that was also very helpful. She showed some other meme things like this particular post that was not by B, I don't think, but by other Tumblr users in this community just to give you like a good idea of the kind of stuff that was going on. So this Twitter user was able to get through these communities before they got banned. And I liked this Twitter user's analysis of this community. She said it was very much like teenagers and young adults that simp over anime characters, even going as far as shipping some shoot to each other, like in this post. Like, very weird. She also made a very good point that this kind of thing can be very alluring to teenagers and minors, especially if they're being bullied or feeling depressed and isolated at school, like many of them do. She also made a great point about how these shooters are often portrayed in the media, like loners, like bullied, isolated kids that have their own little exclusive clubs together and they're super edgy and different. And it's this kind of like world that they're in that others don't know about, which for really young people feeling the same way, this can be very seducing. Of course, I'm referring to just the teenagers and kids that probably are too young to really know any better. And it's more understandable how they get seduced into this because they're not actually planning on causing any harm. They're just kind of romanticizing that toxic kind of side that I was talking about before. I'm not saying that this excuses B's behavior at all because she was definitely in her 20s and knew better. She also got a compilation of some of B's posts on Tumblr. I'm not going to go through them all here, but you can pause the screen if you want to read some of the stuff that she was posting. And then from this other article, I found another compilation of more of her posts. Again, you can pause if you want to read them. Not going to go through all of them in this video. This video is going to be long enough. And speaking of time for this video, the affidavit, the full affidavit is also publicly available online. Again, I'm not going to go through it all here because I think you get the idea idea, but there's public information in that affidavit that describes other damning posts that be made on her Tumblr accounts. The affidavit is like 20 pages. I didn't read the whole thing, but I read a good majority of it. And I will say that if you do get sucked into this case and are interested, the affidavit is very fascinating. It's like everything that led up to her getting arrested. B then had Twitter accounts. She had one that was active in 2013. At least we're pretty sure it's her based on the profile picture, location, and username. But there's literally nothing to note here. She would have been about 18 years old in 2013. She then appeared to make a new account in 2015, which she would have been about 20. But again, she didn't seem to share any of these dark fantasies on Twitter, probably because it was too public. But what is interesting about her Twitter is 
that she is an avid left-leaning person, retweeting a lot of Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama posts. I almost didn't put that in here because I was so embarrassed by the fact that she was left-leaning, but I figured if she was right-leaning, I definitely would have pointed that out because I would have like used it as a confirmation bias of her being a horrible person. So I am going to include it in here because I do think it's important to the story. And it's also very, very, very confusing and ironic because some of the stuff that she was retweeting of these left-leaning posts was about, I mean, preventing climate change, a family trying to find their kid's killer, how the poor people in the USA need help and very into human rights and all this. I even found one of her retweets implying support for the Black Lives Matter movement, but then like one of her favorite killers is someone who carried out their crime for extremely racist reasons. And this is allegedly around the time where she really started to get into all of this cult-like mentalities. So it's just very confusing that she seems to be all into human rights and everything, but she definitely went about it in a very heinous way. Anyway, so around 2013, when her first Twitter account was made, her mother passed away. She was only 18 years old and her mother passed away at 48, very unexpectedly. And this is also allegedly when we think she kind of started to go downhill. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not an excuse for her. Plenty of people lose their mothers and they don't end up as terrible. So this is definitely not an excuse, but it's just something to note, something interesting about her background to try to understand where everything went wrong. DeviantArt. From an article, I also found these photos that are allegedly from Bee's DeviantArt, like these, and this would show that she claimed to be part of the furry community. Again, I'm sure everybody in the furry community hates Bee, or if they knew about her, they would hate her. Like, again, not claiming that people in the furry community are like this. Like, as far as I know, the furry community is a very, very welcoming, happy, good community. So again, don't associate furries with people like B. Again, just something to note. I think this does show that she probably did kind of feel like an outcast. Again, not saying people in the furry community are strange or that they feel like they're outcasts, but just kind of like all this stuff together makes me feel like she was a very pick me girl. So that's like the Tumblr side of things and what B was doing. Um, now we're going to get into this kind of inside look that I have based on information from this anonymous subscriber that helped me with this video on what was going on in the community from the teenager's point of view and these minors that were being manipulated by B and other 20 something year old adults. This subscriber though, they did give me permission to share some of the info that they gave me and it gave some really interesting insight, which we don't usually get in these kind of stories of what it was like to be one of these kids. Now I'm sorry for all these clarifications, but I it is really, really important, especially for this kind of story that we're very clear here. None of the minors that we're talking about in this story were at fault for what happened. They were manipulated and brainwashed by adults, people that were in their early mid twenties who should not have been doing this. And then of course the teenagers fed off of each other as well. And like I said, it was just kind of this brainwashed cult mentality that got out of hand. Now, when I say kids, I mean, these were like 14, 15, 16 year olds on these servers. And then the other thing was that the subscriber also stressed that a lot of them were struggling with mental illness and they just kind of got sucked into this group feeling like they, you know, finally belonged somewhere. And also that as they grew up and became adults, it is very likely that most, if not all of the kids that were in these servers realized that it was super, super bad what they were talking about and how messed up all this stuff was. And they are probably not like this today anyway. And then just note that it, there is no evidence whatsoever that any of the kids in these servers went on to commit any crimes whatsoever. It was all B and her boyfriend, as far as we know. Okay? Okay. So I got a hold of a screenshot from one of the conversations from one of the Discord servers. They get into this conversation about hyperstophilia, which if you don't know, is one of those things we talked about, being super attractive and thinking you're like in love with people who have committed very heinous crimes. One of the users in the group was like, 
gently challenging the others and saying they were confused about the message that everybody was sending and the group is just not having it. Let's just read it here. Remember, some of this is not going to make perfect sense because it's, you know, a Discord server and people just like shit posting a lot. So we'll get, we'll talk about it at the end. So it starts with, I can relate except for the f part. Oof. I mean, he could be sort of cute, but that's just where it stops. Assuming we're talking about some killer. And this next person who I believe is one of the older people in the group say, I want to f him too, honestly. About to flood my basement thinking about Mickey Knox and Dylan Claybold. He's attractive and honestly, body goals are IP me. And then the same older person says, I've always wanted to f someone with downs. I can't get past the bowl cut. I'd be perfectly happy to both look like Adam or had the chance to at least make out with him. He would be such an inexperienced baby and it's cute to be honest. If only boy wasn't as touch phobic as me. Trip on acid and shoot guns with Dylan. Oh, that is the first person from the beginning who was like, they're cute maybe, but I don't think we would want to have sex with them. And then here is ligature markings. This is B. She responds to the one that was starting to get uncomfortable and said, if you feel uncomfortable in this channel, you could post on the informational channels. That same older girl says, I want Eric, Dylan, Adam, and Dylan all to give me at the same time. Whose baby will I have? Oh my God. And then, I mean, I don't feel that uncomfortable. I'm just in a state of doubt and confusion. Ligature markings B says, Dylan, wait, uncomfortable kid. So if you're a hybristophile, that means you condone, right? Pump the brakes, no. Somebody else says, no. Older person, no. Others, no, uh, no. It's difficult because hybrists are people who are attracted to felons and dangerous people, etc. Older girl says, take it to hashtag debate chat box. Un uncomfortable kid says, attracted to anyone who murders because of what they did. Ligature markings, B. Anyway, Dylan Roof probably has muscles now and he can bench press me. Gibberish. Uh, older girl. Anyway, I want Ted Bundy's babies. LOL. If you find killers good looking, then you're just like us. That's literally what we're doing. No one is condoning. Some killers are just hot, uncomfortable kid, but I don't unknowingly call myself a hybristophile. Hybristophile is an umbrella term people use now. That's all. Uncomfortable kid. I don't know. B. Debate chat box. I don't know why it's a problem. Uncomfortable kid. Let's just end this. Like I'm attracted, but not sexually attracted. Sorry. I think some of them could be cute, but that's it. I'm attracted in a weird way, to be honest, but it's cool. That's how I am with one. Older girl responding to uncomfortable kid. Okay, that's fine, but don't make others feel bad for what they like. It's not their fault. They have no control over it. Uncomfortable kid. I'm not insulting them over anything. I never called them effed up or anything. Anything. OMFG. Don't take it personal, all right? I'm just saying my opinion. So this particular reply, again, who I assume I believe is an older girl, like one of the older mods people, was, okay, that's fine, but don't make others feel bad for what they like. It's not their fault. They have no control over it. And that is referring to them romanticizing killers and everything like that. And that response just really rubs me the wrong way. Something about shaming others for stigmatizing something that draws not only a very toxic community, but something potentially dangerous. And then just saying like, well, I can't help it. That's just who I'm attracted to. Gives me real uh, apologist vibes. Like I know it's not exactly the same thing and I'm not claiming that it is, but they are similar in the way that romanticizing violence and idolizing killers like this is definitely something that should be stigmatized in my opinion. And it's one of those other things that's like, maybe you don't need acceptance from society. Maybe you need help. So the subscriber helping me with this video said that they were in this server as well. They knew this particular girl, the one that's not B, but was like defending it and saying like, don't shame us for it. And knew this person through the servers. I talked to them a lot more than this and said that this particular person was extremely manipulative and just kind of a bully. This person would send people very 
unkind DMs. They also said that this shaming game was extremely common in like all of the conversations that they had. If anybody in this community like disagreed with somebody and especially with the idolizing the killers thing, you instantly just got told that you shouldn't make others feel bad for their beliefs and things that they can't help. Like that defense mechanism was thrown around a lot. If anybody said or if anybody even implied that one of these really infamous shooters should be in prison, which I think most of us agree they definitely should be. Like in this group, they would threaten to ban you. And then these 20 something year olds were like pressuring these 14, 15 year olds to change their views and that they were gonna get exiled from the community basically if they didn't change their views. Which you have to understand from a 14, 15 year old perspective, like that's really terrifying. This community that you feel isolated everywhere else and there's finally this community that you like and you feel like you have friends and then you literally cannot disagree with anybody or you're going to be banished. And then unrelated to this particular Discord thread, but my subscriber also told me that they were part of this as a young teenager and that it was also just abusive AF in general. They said that pro-Anna ideals were thrown around a lot and also encouraging, like the adults were encouraging these young teenagers to act on these pro-Anna ideas. They would also say that super cliche thing that abusers like to say. Again, mostly the 20 something year olds telling this to the young teenagers that they were the only ones who ever cared about them and that nobody outside of this community loves them or gives a shit about them. Just like all this kind of messed up stuff to manipulate them and make them weaker and doubt themselves to keep them loyal to the group. So that's the internet side of Elizabeth Lacron. Now we're gonna talk about her real life side. I've been kind of giving this deep dive into the Tumblr and what was going on online to kind of give you guys a really good understanding of what it was like, but you're probably wondering like, okay, what the hell actually ended her up in prison? So Elizabeth Lacron met her future boyfriend, Vincent Armstrong, in February of 2018. Within a couple months, they had started dating and had already moved in together. As they started dating, Elizabeth started planting seeds in Vincent Vincent's head. After they started dating, B would start to tell Vincent about her very unhealthy obsession with mass sh She then started introducing him to the Tumblr and the Discord and all of these communities online that were banding together. Vincent would then soon join the Tumblr community himself under the username Society's Heretic. Both of them lived in the Toledo area in Ohio and offline they would talk about how the two of them dreamed about carrying out one of these massacres in real life. They even had a code name for their plan called D-Day. They dreamed of using both weapons and explosives. Vincent owned an AK-47 and Elizabeth had a shotgun. They would frequent the shooting ranges together just to practice their aim. At home, the two researched they started to build this, and then they decided on a target after a lot of discussion, a bar in the Toledo area. Now, this bar they picked particularly because I believe it was a second floor bar, but regardless, it only had two doors. It only had two places to enter and exit, and this appealed to them because it would make it harder for people to escape. And it would also make it more difficult for the police to interfere before they could do maximum damage. Now, if you thought all that was disturbing, it gets worse. Elizabeth went as far to discuss and plan what she was gonna wear on D-Day. She had a t-shirt with false profit written on it, and that was the shirt that she planned to wear. But even worse, she planned on wearing combat boots. Not only is this reminiscent and for her like a tribute to the Columbine, it, but it's also, I'm not making this up, literally because B thought that combat boots would be best so that she wouldn't slip on her victim's 
Like, how sick do you have to be to think of details like that? They later found journals from B and Vincent. In her journal on June 5th, 2018, Elizabeth wrote an entry about how tiring it was to visit her friends over the weekend, but that it was okay because D-Day would quote unquote, be her salvation. On June 8th, Vincent wrote in his own personal journal, a passage about their plans. Now I have these thoughts, these memories, they haunt me. I have a vision, a vision to kill, to hunt the unwilling. One of the journals also said, soon we will bring destruction to society them. They are worthless, ungodlike scum who want to live by their rules and constructs. In August of that same year, the two then flew to Denver, Colorado to visit the memorial of the Columbine sites. She would post this afterwards on social media. The officer she's referring to in this post believed that the two looked suspicious and they were dressed in dark clothing, posing by the memorial and taking pictures near the memorial site. According to the affidavit, this police officer like questioned them and took down B's information. And then after this post, B soon would post a Tumblr that their next trip was going to be to South Carolina to visit quote unquote, the church. And then it was also found that B was writing letters. She made a little pen pal with one of the really infamous that we discussed earlier, who is currently in prison, the really racist one. The letters to him, of course, described her very, very white supremacist, racist beliefs. And this scumbag did not write a lot of people back in prison, but he would write be back. They wrote back and forth several times. He would ask B for books about and stuff like that. And she happily obliged sending him a book at least on one occasion and saying that she was going to send him one like every couple weeks. She also told him, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in one of the letters that he needed to stay strong because there were people outside of the prison that cared about him. Now, Here's how B got caught. An anonymous citizen tipped off the Toledo law enforcement. I believe that this was one of B's friends, but I have no idea for sure. So the law enforcement, of course, tipped off the FBI. They started tracking B and Vincent's movements from all of their online presence to every move they made in real life. Now, they couldn't just arrest them off of some tip alone. They had to follow them for months and get on the inside in order to like actually have real evidence against them to successfully arrest them and charge them. On September 11th, 2018, B met with one of the community members from the servers. It was someone who had been in the community and like simping over B and like supporting her so much. And then they finally sent her a DM on Tumblr talking to her for a while and then asking finally if she wanted to meet up in person. Little did B know this person who was pretending to support her was a random anonymous citizen who agreed to help the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force or the JTTF. This person gained B's trust by meeting up with her on several occasions and talking enthusiastically about how much he supported her and loved what she did and how he wanted to help. And it worked. B was quite a few things, but she definitely was not the sharpest tool in the shed because she started to divulge information about her plans to this person. So after several meetings on September 11th, 2018, this person asked B if she wanted to meet up and that they were gonna bring two others from this community. So not only is this citizen working for the FBI, but this time the two others that were brought along for this meeting were undercover agents that were FBI agents. At this meeting, the FBI caught Elizabeth saying, and I quote, I want to get out there. I want to like, you know, be part of it, you know? I want to help any way that I can. I've never had an in in this sort of thing. So now that I do, I just want to do anything I can. Later, when asked if she had any concerns about human casualties, B replied, take them out. I don't really feel any type of way for that. I'm here to send a message and get the job done. If they are in the way of the explosion, they're probably part of the problem. So maybe it's for the best. So that was the meeting that she had with FBI agents and she didn't know it. So on December 4th, 2018, the same community member that was like luring her into this trap asked B if she wanted to help them 
a pipeline in Georgia and that this person had this grand plan for it and that wanted to see if B would help them. Now, again, this undercover person was trying to get better solid evidence more than just like quotes and what she was saying, wanted her to do something actionable that they could get on her. And again, it worked. B was actually thrilled to assist them, saying on a phone call that the FBI recorded, absolutely, thank you so much. Hell yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to do. A lot of this phone conversation is quote for quote in the affidavit too, if you wanna read it. Four days later on December 8th, B bought two pounds of Hodgdon 777 muzzle loading propellant, AKA black powder, as well as 665 screws, which I assumed was to be used as shrapnel in the explosion. So there's proof of her purchasing these things. And then she meets up with this person who had these plans and gives it to them. The FBI finally had everything that they needed for a search warrant. They got the search warrants for the couple's house and vehicles. On December 10th, 2018, they found a duffel bag in the trunk of Vincent's car that had two loaded magazines for his AK-47, as well as a tactical vest. He also had an additional two loaded magazines for a pistol, a gas mask, and printed instructions on how to make various explosives. In the house, they found the AK-47, Elizabeth's shotgun, another shotgun, plus two handguns, and more ammunition. So the two were arrested, and at first, they tried to tell the FBI that they were just role-playing. They bought all of that stuff, not because they were going to do it, but just because it was fun and it made the role-playing game more realistic. So they tried to plead not guilty at first, but obviously the overwhelming evidence against them caught up to them. In November of 2019, 24-year-old Elizabeth Lacron was sentenced to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty on two counts. One count of conspiracy to provide material support or resources to terror and another count of transporting exp in interstate commerce. So I think she got this light sentence because she finally agreed to plead guilty to all of these things. She was just kind of caught red handed and didn't have a choice. So when she gets out after she serves the 15 years, she is subject to a lifetime of supervision by government agencies. The FBI will always be watching her. She's basically on probation for the rest of her life, which I do think the prison time was light for what she was planning. However, nobody got hurt in the end. They prevented all of this from actually happening. So I think a lifetime of being supervised by the government is a pretty good punishment. Vincent would plead guilty to similar charges and would ultimately be sentenced to six years of prison and then three years of probation after he's released. It was pretty clear to law enforcement that Elizabeth was the mastermind behind all these plans and that Vincent likely would not have been wrapped up in this stuff and likely wouldn't have been making these plans if it weren't for her manipulating him. And yes, this is just what happened, but I agree with probably most of you that think that he should have gotten the same sentence as Elizabeth. He was an adult and could have made his own decisions and he did not do anything to try to stand up to be, to stop her, to disagree with her. He clearly didn't think what they were doing was bad. And I think if B was gonna do it, I totally believe that he would have followed through with her. However, from a law enforcement point of view, I get it. I mean, to them, Vincent was not as big of a threat. They believed that after looking at all the evidence, it was B that was the real threat to the public and to society, which I mean, again, kind of dumb in my opinion, but that's just how the law works sometimes. So that's one of the worst true crime stories I have ever heard where nobody was actually harmed in the end at least physically. The teenagers were definitely emotionally harmed. Thankfully, somebody had the decency to tip off the FBI and prevent this from happening. We had no physical victims, and to me, that's what matters. I am sure that I'm on some sort of watch list after all the things that I had to Google for this video. If the government comes for me, 
I'm gonna show them this video and y'all can vouch for me. But hey, it's a risk that I'm willing to take. That is going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please like the video if you liked it. And thank you so much to all of my patrons on the screen right now. Special shout out to top tiers Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, JJ, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Dark Sided Otter, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Bambi, Momo Nia, Philip J, Covey, David 88, Sonder, Sage K, Elderly Hipster, Christina Amos, Marita 144, Veronica C, Reese Rolls, and B.